Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Liz Sepiel, who is an executive coach. Welcome to the program, Liz. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. Hey, so give us a little bit of background on yourself. I think that um, so many times when people hear executive coach, um, it kind of gives the connotation that, you know, you're working with a specific uh, subset of people, target group. So what was your background that led you into now feeling that this is a viable target that you want to work with and that your area of expertise and subject matter expertise is something that you can bring to the table? Oh, I love that question. What is my background? Because I find that that's such a juicy question because our our paths, our career paths take so many twists and turns. And way back when, my uh, my game plan was to work on Wall Street. So I actually started out in the world of finance and IT. And after taking a couple of twists and turns down uh, that path, working for nuclear energy firm and landing within uh, the space of federal consulting, I really found my sweet spot in the world of leadership development and coaching and learning and development. And that's where I've spent my time the past 10 years or so. And my work today focuses on those leadership and learning components. So executive coaching, that's a really broad term, yeah. and, and um, it's not just about asking the big questions. Um, a lot of coaches are about that, and that's a really wonderful component to the whole world of coaching. But what I really love to do in my style is really about bringing in the consulting background that I offer in terms of my work as a business partner and having um, really stepped up and led big parts of organizations and, and led big initiatives and, and overseen large teams. And, and I bring in my training background and I really serve my clients as a business partner. And I bring in a lot of agile and leadership methodologies to my work. So we're not just asking the questions, but we're figuring out how to get things done. And then you're working with the team to make sure they get done. Am, am I hearing that correctly as well? We're working with the team to make sure we get things done. And we're also, I, I do a lot of work with solopreneurs. Hmm. So I'm working with them to figure out when it makes sense to actually bring a team on board. Um, so often in the space of entrepreneurship, we want to do it all. Um, we want to wear all the hats and do all the things, and and with that, we also have shiny object syndrome. Yeah, we yeah. love to be creative, right? You you know this. We love to be creative and do all the things, and and we're so easily inspired. Um, but what that does is add a lot to our plate, and it's so easy to pile on the unnecessary and it can take our focus away from the things that can really drive progress. So I work a lot with my clients in figuring out where their energy is best spent and what can be delegated and how can they actually step into the role of being a leader. And one of my clients put this, he framed it in the best way. And he said, you know, I'm finally ready to become a CEO and not just a guy running a business. You know, uh, I think that's really an interesting mindset shift. We could go a lot of directions on that, but I want to pause for just a second and, and go back to shiny object syndrome because I wrote a, a research piece on that on my website, and I just think it's so interesting that what the drivers are behind someone that – 
you know, gets distracted with shiny object syndrome in whatever it is. It might be, you know, hey, I'm going to, um, you know, scroll through my Facebook feed here and, oh, look, um, I need to click on this or, hey, I need to do some research for this project, which is wonderful research, but then you get distracted. And sometimes that shiny object syndrome is kind of a lack of faith in your own self in the sense that I'm on this path doing whatever. Let's just say, um, you know, I'm, I'm working with my team leading them and we've got this initiative but if you get distracted with something you know through like your your distraction or your shiny object syndrome whatever you think of it as maybe it's the fact that you are not secure and faithfully you know approaching that project with faith in your own abilities because it's like uh, i'm gonna bail on this real quick because look this looks better hey, hey guys let's start on this is, is, do you see that ever working with clients where they just need to stay the course trust the process and keep moving forward Absolutely. It, it's fear-based. That's, that's what it is. 98% of the time it's fear-based. I don't really think this will work or I've spent a lot of time doing this, but I'm not really ready to put it out and for it to be seen. So I'm just going to switch gears because I yep. think that person is doing it better. And guess what? Yeah. Um, that idea that you got distracted with, that shiny object syndrome occurrence, that might be a viable idea maybe for later. So I think that there should be that switch, that assessment switch that you can quickly um, not get distracted, assess that really quick to go, you know what, this is something that might have some teeth for later on. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that in the parking lot, right? I'm going to put that in my Evernote or in my whatever um, way that I follow. Cause, cause if you're, uh, you know, following Michael Gerber's e-myth, taking time to work in your business, not, or taking time to work on your business rather than only in your business, maybe the second Friday of every month or the third Thursday or whatever that you pick and you go back to that notebook that file or whatever and go all right it does this still you know, have some some uh, viability to it or you know I'm going to scoop this back out a month or two so there's there may be nothing wrong with that idea it just might not be right right then and you got to just stay that course oh I agree with that it is so important to take those ideas that are floating around and put them somewhere yeah. put them down on paper so that they're not taking up brain space anymore. So what are you finding? Like you mentioned that one client that said, I have finally, you know, summited the peak and I'm ready to be a, a CEO rather than whatever that they were, you know, so maybe they were a VP of something. What do you think that true or what did you notice that trigger point was in their mindset that made them finally realize, you know what, I'm doing great here, but I could also do great as a CEO. Yeah, it was it was a really amazing process to witness. We had been working together for a few months and and on both sides, I think we had had both been planting the seeds that 10 years in business, he was ready to start building a team to help him get to the next level with his business. And what the trigger was was a week of him preparing for a product launch and him realizing that it was extremely taxing on his energy. And he, he came to one of our calls. We met every Monday morning and he said, I just, I don't need to do this anymore. I can do it, but I don't need to. I'd be better served bringing someone on board and handing some of this work off to them. And, and I said, guiding the process. Right. Yes, I said, you're exactly right. How do you want to make that happen? What does this team structure look like? What support do you need? And we started mm -hmm. mapping it out right away. Well, now we can go get into, you know, the, the fear-based people that don't let loose of the reins and feel like I've got to be the one that is in every single thing. And, you know, th that's a whole other uh, concept. But I think it ties right into something else you work with or, or advocate, which is intrapreneurship. So it's almost like if you can have an, an um, organization where the from the, from the bottom line employee all the way up to whoever level where they feel like, you know what, we bought into the mission and the vision. And what if this were my company? How would I want to see this go? And I want to make decisions that would be creative and moving the organization forward, not just punching my clock and going, I'm out of here. So where does that play into some of the um, inner workings that you see? Hmm.
th- what I've been seeing around the entrepreneurship space lately, and and interestingly enough, I've had a lot of conversations about this topic recently, and I've been blessed to work for organizations that are huge proponents of this. And um, one of my prior bosses, I, I was in corporate for nearly 10 years before starting my own my own company. And and one of my bosses, he he coined me a master finagler mm-hmm. because I I knew how I wanted to be challenged. I knew the opportunities and the projects that I wanted to. Um, explore and investigate. And I knew the value that I wanted to bring to the organization. So I was the person, I was the storybook entrepreneur. And I took my consulting background and I brought that to my my internal roles. So I would actually identify areas where I could give back to the organization and I would draft proposals and bring them to my managers and say, here's how we could improve this program, or this is what I think we should do 12 months out. And I was blessed with really amazing leaders who opened the door for those opportunities. And I was was gifted amazing things as a result of that, Um, being able to lead completely new parts of the organization. I, I... led a, a brand new diversity and inclusion organization at a Fortune 500 because I raised my hand for something. Um, so really tremendous value came of that. And where I think this stands now is really with the leaders of organizations. There are so many individuals who want to be innovative and they want to be creative, and they feel boxed into their roles. Yeah. And I think that's why we're seeing the, the growth of the gig economy. People yeah. want to do a lot of things, and they want to have the side hustle. And, and we know the, the stress and the, the time investment that comes with the juggle of all of that. And I think companies need to evaluate how they can be supportive of their employees having these ideas and being innovative and and what does that mean structurally? What does that mean in terms of managing up? Um, I, I think that those are discussions that need to be had. You know, I don't know the stats for this, but it just struck me while you were describing that, that I'll bet that if you looked backwards in the last five years, let's say, like you mentioned the gig economy, and I, I um, interviewed someone recently that, you know, pioneered that whole concept. And, and it really is so much easier today to start your business, do a side hustle, moonlight, whatever you want to think of it as, because, you know, you got a phone, you got internet, you've got, you know, sites like Elance or whoever, uh, or Upwork now. Um, but the question is, what percentage or, or how often was it that an employee would leave a firm to go start their own business? And now, how has that changed with people moonlighting or doing side hustle that might even have a little bit of a gray area infringement on what they're doing for their job, but maybe they're kind of walking the thin line. But with the concept of entrepreneurship, I would wonder if that was fostered in an organization, if that would stem off that, you know, side hustle to the point that it's not going to impact the organization because now we're giving them that outlet, that release for creativity and for creating something. And you're just doing it internally and you're seeing your ideas come to life. And, you know, the, uh, this other team is taking it and running with it with you at the lead and it, and you're still doing your main job, but, but it gate, it gives employees the feel that, Hey, I am contributing. I matter. And they don't have to feel like I need to do something on the side. And maybe even there's an income component to it. Maybe the, the organization gives them a little bit of a bonus when, when things work out. And I just wonder if that would do uh, two big things, which is number one, help the organization. And number two, keep that employee in, in place uh, longer um, without them feeling like I'm going to go out and do something on the side. Yeah. I bet for a lot of people it would, that intrinsic value of having such autonomy over a creative yep. process. I mean, for it's a huge driver for a lot of entrepreneurs to be able to own something yeah. and to call it your own and, and to have that within the stability of an organization. It's kind of the best of both worlds. 
Yeah, because you think about, you know, what to take for a startup and investment and all of those things. But if you had that little security break blanket of your organization and like you were mentioning, you presented some proposals to to some bosses in the past. Well, what would happen if some employee um, put together a proposal for their organization? And what if there was a component of an increased compensation? And maybe the employee said, look, if this thing goes the way I feel it would be, you know, after quarter one of, of putting this in place, we should see revenues increase by X. And so what I'm proposing is that I have a revenue share of Y, whatever the case is. But then I think that that really does, even if even if that goes nowhere and and the boss is like, you know what, we can't do a revenue share, but let's let's have you run with this. I think it really does go back to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, where they want that achievement, accomplishment, recognition, you know, that kind of a thing. So I, I just love that mindset of on entrepreneurship. So it's entrepreneurship under the confines of that umbrella. So I, I think that's really, uh, really awesome. So, you know, I know that you all also teach and speak or advocate on an interesting concept, which, which I'll, I'll just uh, read here and then you can uh, go deeper on. But what's the connection between addiction, resiliency and leadership? Oh, what, what a broad question. And we don't have four yeah. hours to cover this one. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> So this is something that I'm speaking a bit more on um, over a, a summit that I'm I'm speaking on. Um, it's called um, the Lead Women Summit. I'm one of the speakers. It's it's on uh, February 20th, and um, speaking all about addiction and leadership and the paradigm shifts that can occur as one goes through the experience of addiction and and how that can really reframe the career path and the the sense of importance in terms of the american dream and the corner office and the the sense of stability that one might think comes from working in a large corporation and when you experience something that is so life-changing your thoughts and your ideals shift quite a bit sure and as you think about how you operate as a leader a lot comes up right? There's a lot of correlation between addictive behaviors and being a good leader, which is really fascinating to think about, right? Being a risk taker, sure. being an investigator, um, being really resilient and, and being really driven. So um, I won't spend four hours talking about all of that, but, but um it, it is something that I, I speak and write about quite a bit from personal experience. So just a high level sneak preview of some of that. Yeah. You know, and it makes me think of it's uh, you've seen these, these uh, contrast kind of charts, you know, um, wow, that, that kid is, is strong willed. Well, that's the negative uh, um, description, but the positive is, they've got leadership qualities and they, and so I think that you really can kind of draw those correlations between an addictive type behavior. And, you know, you could say I'm addicted to fill in the blank. And then the outworking, if you wanted to overcome that, maybe could be, you know, I'm going to pour myself into my work. Well, then the negative of that, cause that's positive. I'm going to pour myself into my work. The negative could be, Ooh, let's have that work life balance and let's not be a, you know, have that addictive behavior be 24 seven. And now these other areas of your life are out of balance. Yeah. There's always light and shadow sides. Yeah. And, and what can you glean from that and learn about yourself? So speaking of learning about yourself, whether it's personal, professional, what would be some triggers or um, aha moments that someone may think, you know what, um, Liz might be able to help me with this. What would some things be that um, someone would be going through or experiencing right now that they could say, you know what, that's interesting. I might want to reach out and connect. And then what kind of, um, um, what could they expect? 
Great question. So typically people come to me, they find me when they want to get stuff done and they have too much on their plate and they're looking for an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clients also come to me when they're looking to find a way to get their expertise out there for their clients. So in addition to executive coaching, I also work with entrepreneurs and startups and turn their expertise into different learning modalities. So I work as a strategic partner and help them craft learning experiences, whether that's a workshop, a course, a mastermind, and I either walk them through a high-level strategy or I get really embedded in the process and actually create the content and the curriculum and find a way to um, really bring their expertise to life in a way that speaks to their clients. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole um, area right there we could spend four more hours on because that's huge. <laughs> you know, and, and you think about it, what is it that sets yourself apart in your industry? So if you're that entrepreneur or even thought leader in an organization, you know, you're bucking for a promotion. Let's just think about that even for a second. Um, Maybe your competitors have finished this project or done this thing. Well, what is it about you that you can kind of bundle up in a nice box with a red bow on it and say, here's me, here's what I've done. And then from an entrepreneurial standpoint, what are some things that when your prospective client, your target audience um, engages with you even before a conversation, what could they see that, that would make them think you're more than just, you know, these bullet points, you're someone that is that trusted advisor. And so I think that's a, a, a such a huge, you know, real in reality, blue ocean when you think about that. So I think I love how, how you ended with that. So let's, um, let's do this. If someone is looking at, you know, staking their claim into taking their self personally, professionally to the next level, um, what's the best way that they can reach out and connect with you? Yeah, so you can find me over on my website. Hopefully we can include a link to this because my name's a little tricky. Yep. Um, but it's, it's elizabethcpl.com. I will definitely include a direct link right in the show thank notes, so don't you. worry about that. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for your time today, Liz. It was really great getting to know you. Thank you so much. This was so fun. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.